now there's an outward expression. There's an entire generation of people that mm -hmm. look the same as you that are now motivated yeah. to get on a bike for the first time. That's wild. And that's why it's so important, man. Like, there's a difference between like getting top 20 and winning. And the last thing I wanted to do as a kid was get in the way of. Can you take me back or can you remember the low points that shaped who you are today? If you attack and you you go on the sidewalk, they kick you out of the race. So like he was telling me, I don't think that it matters. Like I'm, I'm not going to change my mind. Was it always a dream or can you remember that moment where you wanted it to become more than a pastime? Have you done Manhattan Beach before? I haven't done it now. Yeah, I've been going to that race since I was like four years old. So like I've been around cycling my entire life. Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Anthony. I'm a former lawyer turned cyclist turned podcast host who's based in Ireland. My goal with this channel is to introduce you to the people and to the ideas to help you optimize your health, your happiness and your longevity. Today we have a guest that you're not going to want to miss. A guy who's a sensation not just in the world of crit racing but also in the realm of content creation. Folks, we've got Corey Williams with us. You've probably seen Corey's electrifying race footage in YouTube where he takes you into the very core of the peloton, giving you an adrenaline rush from the comfort of your home. But today, we're going a step further. We're peeling back the layers to understand the man, to understand Corey, the persona behind the nation's number one beast. We're diving into his life journey, what it takes for a kid of color to excel in a white dominated sport, to build one of the most recognizable brands in cycling, Legion and the challenges of juggling all this with fatherhood. This is the Roadman Cycling Podcast. To support it, please check out the sponsors in the description below. And now, my dear friends, it's Corey Williams. Corey Williams, welcome to the Roadman Cycling Podcast. Dude, thank you for having me back. Man, it is a pleasure. How has having a child changed your training? Well, it's crazy. Uh, she, she decides to cry on Friday nights right before so basically on saturday i usually wake up at 5 a.m to go out and do like five and a half hours and friday night is rough so basically she'll cry and then my plans are either done or you know i'm a zombie the next day so it's been pretty challenging sometimes for sure like we're in this era now where everybody's measuring everything do you measure your sleep and what impact has the child had on your sleep I don't measure my sleep. I do sometimes use a whoop, but I, I more use that for an excuse to, to get myself to try and get some recovery. But most of the times I don't listen to it anyway. <laughs> yeah, that that's, I feel, the challenge with, especially as a parent, if you're looking at it, you would just never train because it just says, no, I'm not yeah. fit to try and not fit to try and. Yeah, I remember uh, when she first came, I was getting ready for this crit series called Tulsa Tough, and I was training really hard and getting no sleep. So I will be like operating on like 20% recovery every day, <laughs> going out, doing like three hours and then like having to stay up with the baby. It was, it was wild. And basically when I got to the race, I had one good day and I never recovered throughout the series. People always say that becoming a parent causes them to kind of pause and reflect. Did you have time to reflect at in the last year? Like how did you go from being just another kid on a bike to becoming a symbol of change in a sport that has historically been very slow to evolve like was there mm -hmm. a single aha moment when you knew this mission was bigger than you winning bike races yeah i mean i think there was there's was a moment in 2021 where you know the crowd is is changing and, and now you can see more color in, in the events that we go to like there's people of all all backgrounds and there was these uh these two little girls that were African-American and she came up to me and she was like, I came here to see you race. And she was probably like seven years old. And I was like, that's, that was the moment for me where I was like, Holy shit, this is like, this actually means something. You know, I've been racing bikes since I was nine years old. And of course you want to think that you're making an impact, but like to actually see it is, is really crazy. 
Yeah, because we're so inward focused as athletes and we think exactly. that, you know, you winning a, a Tulsa Tough or you winning the final crit in Redlands, we think that matters, but really it doesn't matter shit. Exactly. Yeah. But, but you and your brother have managed to transcend that inward looking view that every cyclist has. And now there's an outward expression. There's an entire generation of people that mm-hmm. look the same as you that are now motivated yeah. to get on a bike for the first time. That's wild. And that's why it's so important, man. Like, you know, there's times where you have to, to realize that there's kids looking at you and like, yeah, let's say the race didn't go the way you want it or you crash or, or something happens. Like for me, I always remember like, Hey, okay. Like, yeah. You're mad right now, but there's tons of people looking at you like that came here to see you and you have to like, turn it off. Like, you know, I crashed and people still wanted photos. <laughs> like I had to like put that aside and you know, go take photos. And it's just a part of the job. But has that been a challenge? I remember footage went kind of semi viral last year. I think it was your brother and possibly you were in it as well of like mm-hmm. an altercation after the finish line. Like <laughs> yeah. how hard is it to put the brakes on an emotionally charged moment like that? It was funny because I had it under control. Like basically uh, this guy came under me in the first turn. There was three more turns to go and it, it, it kind of didn't make sense. And he hooked my elbow and basically my front wheel turned. It came off the ground, it turned and it shot me towards the corner. And he thought that I took him into the curb. And basically what happened was when I came around, he was coming backwards looking for me. And I just was explaining to him, like, hey, like, you clipped my elbow. I didn't try and put you into the curb. The only reason I didn't crash was because your body was there. Like you literally took my front wheel off the ground. And later there was a video in that exact corner. Thank God, because he was trying to say that I just took him into the curb and I was explaining that to him. And then Justin came over and Justin was mad. Obviously I'm his younger <laughs> brother. And then and so, and he was behind me and I do literally almost like he could have potentially killed me. There was a freeway like on the right side. So, like, it, it becomes, like, this thing where, yeah, there's a fine line between, like, understanding that there's people watching you and, like, being a human being and reacting, right? So, basically, yeah, things got heated. And I was still, like, I was in the middle of it trying to stop it. Like, I didn't throw any punches or anything. I was just trying to stop the fight. But that's also me being in the moment and all of that heat and understanding that, yeah, we have a lot to lose and we need to try and control ourselves. And, yeah, I tried to break it up, so. Because that is quite a fine line because the nature of criterium racing, it's testosterone fueled, it's, you know, everybody wants to be at the front. Anyone has ever done a criterium, anyone with mm-hmm. experience, I'll say to them, oh, you need to be at the front. Well, yet you guys <laughs> are at the front. You know, yeah. every everybody's fighting for those small few positions, but yet you guys occupy them. And I, I don't want to say you occupy them under the threat of violence, but there is an intimidation factor as to why you guys occupy them. So yeah. you need to, it's skill, it's intimidation, it's, you know, it's physical fitness. It's a multiple of elements, but you need to tread that line carefully between intimidation and leaning on somebody. And, you know, like you're saying there, when it spills over into more than that, and you're like, oh, we actually have a lot to lose more than other guys. Yeah. Here. Yeah. I mean, it's become hard, right? Because you can't really enforce anything anymore because there's cameras everywhere. And as soon as you defend the line or something, they're going to put you on the internet and call you a bully. But I remember being younger and, and trying to like, I was actually just watching. I would never ride up on the big teams because one, I wasn't capable of winning and I'm not the type of person that's going to get in the way if I'm not capable of, of winning the race. Like, yeah, there's, there's a difference between like getting top 20 and winning and the last thing I wanted to do as a kid was get in the way of the big guys. And I see what they do to people that come up on them. They literally take them to the curb. I so paid like, that guy. You're not in healthcare taking me to the curb. I remember exact, it well. <laughs> exactly. Right. So like they didn't have the social media and they could do whatever they want. So yeah, there was a fear for those guys, right? Like they, they you had to respect them or maybe you're going to be on the ground and like, we can't do that. So it's been hard to like try and control a race without being able to like put someone to the curb if they're not respecting you. So like, we just have to find another way. We set, we have to ride faster. And that's the only thing you can really do. Take me back to the beginning. Did you grow up in a house that was immersed in cycling or what was your introduction to the sport? Yeah. So my dad uh, 
Dude, I've been going. So there's this. Have you done Manhattan Beach before? It's it was like one of the bigger yeah. NRC Don't races. I, yeah, I know, so, but I haven't done it now. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I've been going to that race since I was like four years old. So like, I've been around cycling my entire life. Was it always a dream, or can you remember that moment where you wanted it to become more than a pastime? Uh, it wasn't always a dream. I remember uh, just wanting to be involved in something that my dad was doing. Like, yeah, I have fun doing bike races, but I played football for, for a long time as well. And that was kind of something I wanted to do, but, you know, I didn't grow tall enough. <laughs> so, like, I uh, had to make a choice in high school, uh, cycling or football, and I chose cycling. I felt like I was a little bit better at it. The crazy success you've had on the bike, and it's been amplified on, you know, your amazing YouTube, Instagram, and sharing it across social, and the brand you guys have built with Legion. And that narrative of overnight success or that phrase overnight success is thrown around a lot, but that's rarely the case. Can you take me back or can you remember the low points that shaped who you are today? Yeah, I mean, I had a pretty successful junior junior career. And then I remember that first year going into the elites and like hanging on for my life and all of these bike races in it. <laughs> And like you said, I, I've documented it on YouTube and you can go back and there's a lot of those videos or times where I'm like 40th place, 50th place are getting dropped. So like it took mm, from like 2012 to 2015, I struggled a lot in those years and it took a while to like get my feet under me, get the confidence to try and go for uh, wins. What was the big thing that upped your game? Was it, you know, straight out season on season compound and growth, smarter training, or was there a, a mental head game element to this as well? There was a, it was a funny, I used to think I was training, right? And like, there's a funny moment where I got on my first uh, pro team and I went to a training camp and we were riding so fast. And I was like, I've been doing something wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've been riding way too slow. I was doing like, 170 watt averages on on rides and i thought that was training and it wasn't so basically like the the team required me to have a coach uh my coach is uh this guy named adam mills and i'm still with him today and yeah he's we just done off season after off season and i think just that building of those off seasons has just leveled me up a lot but isn't that the crazy thing? You're the last generation. It was the same for me when I was getting started. I went out uh, for ice cream with my girlfriend the other night. We were going up past the local hill. And she's getting into cycling now. And she was saying to me, oh, like so many people train here at night. And I was like, that's all I done. I was like five nights a week after university. I used to go to this hill with my buddy, just the two of us. And we didn't know anything about training. So we used to just race each other for like three, four hours every night in the dark up and down this hill. Like it's a 15 minute climb. We just smash each other like all night. Yeah. And that was the only training we knew how to do because there wasn't this proliferation of information that we see now with, you know, mm -hmm. podcasts and GCN and amazing cycle power blogs. Meters. Yeah, everyone now, like yeah. the best riders then had a power meter. The worst mm -hmm. riders now have a power meter. Mm -hmm. You almost that's, can't train bad now. That's the, I mean, laziness will get you. <laughs> but yeah, you have all the tools. I wonder now though, is the head game becoming more important you know that moment in a race when your body's telling you to stop but something else clicks in it's like a sense of identity that we don't lose or mm -hmm. we don't lose wheels or whatever that is is that now going to become the separator yeah i think so i think that well okay so i think two things i think that because there are power meters on everyone's bike and they can't just go out and ride at like let's say 300 watts all day i think the separation is now yeah who has the uh, the most skill on the bike and who actually pays attention to learning how to do a bike race like yeah they might be able to ride at 300 watts but they don't know how to control their bike or they don't know race tactics there's a lot that actually goes into it it's not all about power i actually recently heard a story from a, a buddy uh, christian vandervelt and he was saying your brother was working on an up-and-coming rider, Ashlyn Barry. And before working with your brother, he was having to average these crazy numbers, like almost 400 normalized in NCC crits 
just yeah. to get around the race. And then uh, like he was talking to your brother and he's like, like, no, I'm putting out way less than that and I'm way heavier than you. It's just you yeah. don't know how to handle your bike and you don't know the ebb and flow of these races. And, mm-hmm. and he managed to drop his normalized power down by almost 100 watts. Yeah, it's so the thing is, yeah, like I said, the power meter thing is even I get the get the like the bug of just like thinking that higher power is better. And sometimes I'll look at my average and I'm like, Oh, I need to actually pay attention to what I'm doing. Cause like the race that I did on Friday, I was averaging 300 Watts and like, I don't, that's not what I want to average. So I got that actually down to 270 by the end of the race. That's amazing. I, I say this to people all the time, to clients in races, especially time trials, Power doesn't win races. Speed wins races. Exactly. Exactly. Corey, many athletes face barriers in sports, but you've had the added challenge through your whole career of breaking ground and navigating to traditional barriers that any cyclist has to navigate, but also Mm. breaking racial barriers. Do you mind talking about that experience? Yeah. I mean, it's it's something that we still face today. I, I literally had an experience at the same race that I was telling you about on Saturday, there was this guy, he like cut the course basically. And I was going up to one of the officials and I was like, Hey, this guy looks back at me and turns and starts walking like really fast. And I like yell like, Hey, and he comes back. He's like, Oh, I can't, I can't hear you. You don't need to yell at me. And I was like, dude, you literally just looked at me and now you're walking away. And basically there's a, I had my camera. And I showed the guy cutting the course, and one of the officials was like, oh, yeah, he wasn't on the other side of the barriers. And I'm like, he jumped on the sidewalk. And in Europe, if you attack and you are you go on the sidewalk, they kick you out of the race. So, like, he was telling me, like, oh, well, I don't think that it matters. Like, I'm, I'm not going to change my mind. So, like, I went to the other officials, and I was explaining to them, like, if that was me, I would be out of the race so fast. And a couple of them like got together and then they finally changed the decision. But one of them were, was like set on that. It was fine that the guy cut the course and that's like, it, it didn't make sense to me. How do you separate actually a, a better way to frame this question is uh, true. An example, a friend of mine is visually impaired. Mm. And I remember being in a shop with him one day and he came across the counter and he put his cup of coffee on the, you know, the debit card machine. So he mm-hmm. put it down on the uneven surface and it tipped over and it spilt everywhere. And then I was like, you know, embarrassed because there was coffee everywhere. He was kind of mm-hmm. embarrassed. The shop clerk was embarrassed. And then it all got mopped up anyway. And he paid for the coffee. And then afterwards, when, you know, it was a less tense moment, I was like, you know, is that like, is that embarrassing? Is that like a, a difficult for you to deal with all the time? And he's like, no, he's like, I have a, I have a system for when I'm putting something on a flat surface, I clear it with my right hand first and I mm-hmm. put it down with my left hand so it doesn't happen. He's like, I didn't do that. I broke my system. So mm-hmm. I get I get to attribute that mistake to me being careless rather than me yeah. being visually impaired. Mm-hmm. When you're looking at situations like that, how do you how do you deal with that same like allocation of like the box you put it into? Is it someone being a jackass because people are jackasses or is it someone being a jackass because they're a racist? How do you compartmentalize that? You know, I like to, to try and get people the benefit of the doubt. So uh, I would like to say being a jackass and, and maybe that's something that I do to, to protect my, my emotions and my feelings. Uh, but yeah, I like, I like to say that people are jackasses rather than being racist. And hopefully, hopefully that's the case. You've been a super outspoken advocate for diversity in sport. Do you think it's made a difference? Yeah, 100%. I, I, uh, just the amount of people that show up to these bike races that are of color, it's blowing my mind. Like literally I show up to these races and people are there for us you know and and it's been like an amazing experience because you know you you roll around and you like to think that you're not making that much of a difference but like when they when you see the crowd and you see all of these people and they're screaming for legion it's yeah it's touching for sure let me take a second to talk about today's show sponsor because i have something really exciting to share with you it's a game changer that's been making a noticeable difference in my performance recently especially when it comes to sleep Allow me to introduce you to Pillar. 
While we're all familiar with the importance of electrolytes and carbohydrates in our race preparation, Pillar is taking a different route. It's focusing on something called micronutrition, ensuring that you're ready to perform even before you ever hit the start line. It's all about promoting a good night's sleep, facilitating effective recovery and replenishing those crucial micronutrients so you can perform at your best. Over the past month, I've been incorporating Pillar's triple magnesium supplement into my routine. I take it every evening, about 30 minutes or so before bed, and I've seen a remarkable improvement to my sleep quality. I've been tracking my sleep with my Whoop device, and the results, they're there every morning when I wake up in black and white. I'm waking up with about a 10% improvement in my restorative sleep. I'm waking up feeling refreshed, Having had that deep restorative sleep, I'm now ready to attack work, training, and life the next day. But don't just take my word for it. Let the data from your fitness tracker tell the story. So if you're ready to elevate your performance and the quality of your sleep, why not give Pillar a try? Head over to pillarperformance.shop and use the code ROADMAN on your local website for 15% off your first order. Or for US listeners, if you head over to defeat.com forward slash pillar and use code ROADMAN for the same 15% off your order. The details of this offer are in the description below. Now back to the show. When I look at people driving this mission forward, because I think any impartial viewer of sport will say that you know it should be inclusive that we should have you know no barriers whether it's socioeconomic political or racial to participation in sport and when i look at who's driving it forward i think of you guys and i think of michael de lagrange and the amani project and i love what they're doing because for a long time we've had the likes of you where you have to come to europe and mm-hmm. it's a big expense to come to europe and you come there for one or two races and it's like this once off pressure filled audition. And if you yep. don't perform on this one occasion in this pressure filled audition, everyone's able to throw that stereotype back in your face, say, hey, you know, it, it's just not good enough. It's yep. just culturally he's not good enough. He doesn't get it. Whereas the likes of Remco, you know, you have years to marinate. You can go, yeah. you can make your mistakes, get your 40th position, DNF, get 50th position, DNF, season after season, make small incremental improvements until mm-hmm. you have the breakthrough. And then everyone goes, it's an overnight success. It's Remco. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that is a, a perfect example of why a lot of the Americans go over to Europe and they struggle. Like, you go over there, like you said, it's so much pressure to do good because, you know, everyone's rooting against you and everyone wants to say, like, see, I told you. And, like, yeah, for us, I feel like we've tried to take away the pressure of performing. And now, like, just because, well, I guess that was in the beginning because now, like, we're expected to win at some of these races. And, like, there, there's a pressure in that, but, like, we don't put pressure on each other. I think there's more of an outer pressure on us. So like we can be comfortable if one of us didn't feel good. We're not like, Hey, like why don't like we always give the benefit of the doubt. And it's because, you know, most of us show up all year round. What do you think the normal Joe or Jane who is in a cycling club and is looking to promote more inclusion and be more welcoming of riders of every background, Mm -hmm. what do you think they can do? I think uh, showing up to group rides, you know, being social and, you know, talking to the person next to you. I think that everyone wants to feel included in something. And like if you're riding around with, I, I mean, I guess it depends, right? Because some people use group rides, for instance, for training and they have the headphones in. But I think some social rides would be good and trying to figure out, you know, what clubs you want to ride with and showing up to bike races and supporting, you know, your favorite team and just being like a part of cycling, I guess. Uh, Yeah, you just want to be social, I guess. Creating Legion was a really bold move and it's an ingenious move in so many ways as well because you look at the the merry-go-round in European teams, like as a lotto Quick step to Koenig, mm-hmm. Sudal, like what's mm-hmm. going on there? It's just sponsors are interchangeable. And there, there's no equity getting built in the franchise. And mm-hmm. in North American teams and Premier League teams for years, we see that equity getting built in the franchise. For the first time ever, a single team, we're seeing equity getting built in the franchise. Mm-hmm. What inspires you to create Legion? It's funny, man. Like we have so many examples. 
like in American sports. It's the Los Angeles Lakers, and they have sponsorships that change, but they're never they're never like like you said the the lotto like that changes. I, I feel like. I am a fan of the team that my grandfather was a fan of. You know, it's the same name, it's the same team, and I think there's a lot of importance in that. Like, how do I follow a team that's called, you know, Old Spice, and then next year <laughs> it's called something else? And, like, it, it just gets lost in translation to where, like, you can't build generation like generations of fans. And I feel like that was one of our biggest things that we wanted to, to build. For me, coaching, the most rewarding experience that I've seen, it actually hasn't been. I've had a bunch of riders who've kind of come from cat four to cat one. And yeah, that's pretty cool. You get a kick out of watching that progression and seeing the smile on her face. But actually what's much more impactful is watching how cycling can go beyond competition. It's watching mm-hmm. clients that can kick an addiction, that can lose weight, that can defeat mm-hmm. mental health problems, all because of their bike. Can you share any of those rewarding moments from your experience with building the Legion brands that kind of went beyond the winning Redlands? Yes. I think, uh, you know, when we go do these bike shop visits or like when we go to the Rafa's that we, we do like Q&As at and you just hear the stories of like, you know, I got into cycling because of you guys. Like, I bought a bike because of you guys. And I think a lot of it came uh, with COVID, which was <laughs> was a blessing in disguise for us. I think that there were so many more people that got into cycling there that, like, you know, found my YouTube or they, they found some of these things and they, like, they went to their first bike race. And, like, that's where you see, like, the impact is so much bigger than winning Redlands. It's like people are coming to the sport, looking for something to be a part of, and Legion is there. Like that's awesome for us to like have that kind of impact and structurally how's the team set up now is it gonna be something that's around for the next five years ten years or are you still on a year by year deals Uh, i mean most of our deals are like we're signing like three four years at this point so like hopefully we're going to be around for a long time we don't have any uh plans of of messing it up i hope (laughs) because you're it seems like it's you know you see companies like rafa and i do like rafa so i don't want to dog on them but mm-hmm. they're you're i don't want to say it's they're exploiting you because at the same time you're almost exploiting them you're capitalizing mm-hmm. on this wave of diversity and inclusion and you're able to ride that wave rafa are trying to tick that diversity and inclusion box from their corporate spend mm-hmm. and you guys are also able to position yourselves to capitalize on that has that been quite deliberate i think uh we like to call well our sponsorships are more partnerships i feel like we all benefit from from it rafa has one of the biggest cycling clubs in the world and also we have we have like you said that diversity diversity uh and inclusion box that they can tick so like yeah it's, it's a partnership we we both get stuff out of it does it feel hollow? Like, is if we're looking for real diversity and inclusion in brands like that, should we be looking at CEOs and CFOs and COOs as people of color? I mean, I think we'll get there. Uh, I don't, I don't think that it should be something they do out of pity. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's going to be people working their way up in the company that will get there. Um, but it starts, you know, it starts here. It starts out on the road. It starts, you know, people get into cycling and then you meet somebody and that's how you actually, Oh, I can maybe work for Rafa. Like if I retire and you know, I don't run Legion anymore, I can go work for Rafa and maybe one day I can be uh, in a high position there. So I I feel like just more people get of color getting into the sport that opens a lot more doors. You've hooked up some cool collaborations like uh, Rafa, Zwift, specialized if you could collaborate with anyone any artist musician brand that kind of expresses the spirit of legion who would that be oh that's a good question who would that be uh we're gonna have to get back to that one that that's you should have sent those questions a little earlier so i could thought about that (laughs) (laughs) Like I was trying to think before, who's the sound of LA? Who's the the musician of your youth? Who's the the song that encapsulates everything you guys are doing? It's kind of countercultural. Yeah, you know, 
I know Snoop Dogg does a, a lot of uh, collaborations, and like he's a, he even has a, a kids show at this point. So like if we <laughs> could, if, yeah, if we could collaborate with Snoop Dogg, I actually uh, played football in his little league uh, that he created. It was called uh, oh, it was called Snoop League, and I played <laughs> football. Need- I played football there for like four years, so that would be pretty cool. You need to make that happen, Corey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I want to give. I love uh, when I listen to a podcast and I walk away with something tangible. And I know so many people listen to the podcast now. They're a little intimidated by criteriums and they're listening to one of the best criterium specialists in the world. So I want to give them something that they can walk away with. If you were starting out now as an mm-hmm. upcoming criterium racer, what's the kind of tips that you wish you knew back then that you know now? So it's it's not something that I wish I knew. It's something that I wish more people knew. Uh, growing up in cycling, I, I feel like people have this goal of getting out of the category really fast. Uh, for me, even when I was young, I always thought that it would be better because they kick you out. When you win too much, they kick you out. So my goal was to get kicked out of every category so that I had that time to learn how to actually win a bike race in different ways. So like, I remember being like 17 years old and the kids like I was a cat. I was in category three, which is like mid category. And they would all make fun of me like, oh, why are you moving up? Like we're all cat twos, but the cat twos race with the pros. So like if I move up, I'm not going to have any experience whatsoever. It's going to be like I'm just going to be holding on for my life. So instead of moving up, I took my time and learned how to actually race my bike and learn tactics. So I, I feel like I wish everyone tried to do that before they just tried to go from the bottom to the top as fast as possible. I think that's great advice. We have a club league scene here in Europe where you've open races, you know, like you do in the US on the weekends and some weeknights in the summer. But you also have a club league that runs all summer and it's you can't get promoted in it. It's just like there's not that cut one, two, three, four. So you're mm-hmm. just in your group, you're in your group. But it's a great place to go and learn to win. And some people, when they start getting to cut one, they think they're too good to race club league races or when they're yep. cut two, they're too good to race club league. I'm always like, go, learn how to win. Like, learn how to win a tailwind sprint. Where do you open out a headwind sprint yep. to win? How how do you win a hill climb? Like, learn how to develop these different skills because you don't get many chances to sprint for a win in a pro race. Yeah, and basically, if you if you would call this club league, I go to the training crits every Thursday. And I'm doing different things like, okay, if I wanted to win a race solo, where, how long could I actually ride off the front by myself? And I know that I don't want to do 20 minutes off the front, so I'm looking for like <laughs> maybe 15 or 10 minutes. Like that's a lot of things that you, you can go there and learn. It's not like you know everything. I don't know everything about myself and I don't know everything about racing. I want to go out there and I want to learn. And the brilliant thing with that is as well, you understand the importance of wind. You're like, exactly. okay, I can attack with 10 minutes to go in a tailwind. But mm-hmm. if I attack with 10 minutes to go into a headwind, I'm toast. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's just about learning learning the bike and learning how to actually be successful in, in a lot of different situations. If we fast forward 40 years and we're two grumpy old men sitting down for a pint of Guinness over here in Dublin and we're looking back on your life and your career, what do you hope will be your enduring legacy? I hope I inspired uh, all all the people in cycling to to be themselves. Like I know uh, I'm a bit flashy with my gold chains and my, my diamond studded uglies, but I just I hope I inspire people to be themselves and not fall into the line of like this robotic cyclist. Corey, I love it. Thanks for chatting. Of course, man. Have a good one. If you enjoyed this chat with Corey Williams, please press here for another conversation that I know you're going to love. And please don't forget to subscribe to the show.